Welcome to um, our uh, rapid problem solving webinar. Um, this is the last webinar of 2021. Um, please you're able to join us. My name is Dave Brunt and I uh, manage the activity at the Lean Academy. I'm joined by two of our senior lean coaches, Peter Watkins and David Marriott today. OK, so um, I'm sure many of you are aware, but we've got quite a number of new people um, on this on this webinar. But and for those that are new to LEA, um, we were founded in 2003 by Dan Jones as a not for profit organisation. Our, um, our aim is to help people become self-reliant on their lean journey. And we have products and services that we offer to customers based around three key value streams, uh, learn, teach and coach and share. And at the intersection of these is um, our, learn, our lean learning journey platform where we're writing down in a usable form the key knowledge required to learn and implement lean. The materials are organised around the Lean Transformation Framework, which we both research and develop with partner organisations. And the materials and processes that we develop are based on a fundamental principle. Um, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach him how to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. To put today into context, the materials are all about knowledge, so skill level one. However, you can develop understanding by learning yourself online using the rapid problem solving level two course that, that's uh, on the learning platform. To become capable, however, you need to practice and that's done best done with real problems at the workplace. Um, we do offer teaching and coaching for, for this and we offer a process to help you once capable to be able to train and teach others in your organisation. Um, and it really mirrors the, um, the approach that we know excellent companies like Toyota, um, how they develop capability, very simple and effective and uses a plan, do, check, act methodology at each stage. So let's move on to today's content. Uh, next up is an explanation of our teach poster method. And then Peter will provide an introduction to problem solving in terms of purpose, process and people. We'll then take some questions. Um, I'm going to give an overview of the four steps of rapid problem solving and then hand over to David Marriott, who will share some insights around the rapid problem solving quadrant chart. We'll discuss how to develop understanding on both your lean journey and the journey you develop for your colleagues before we have a final discussion and a QA session. Um, before we look at the teach poster method, let's look at some problems with problem solving. So there are lots of problems with problem solving. Um, lots of problems with the way we manage problem solving in organisations. So here's our current vital for you. Firstly, focusing on certification instead of capability. Um, trying to use A3s for everything when the only tool that you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. Um, only containing problems, not getting to root cause, then wondering why we're dealing with the same issues over again. Not using Plan Do Check Act, instead jump into solutions. Um, as a leader, trying to solve everything. So all we end up doing is running around fighting fires. And then we have little time to coach and develop others. When we're not skilled in problem solving, it takes us way too long. Understanding the theory, but not being able to apply it to a situation. And then finally, not capture, capturing and visualising problems. Um, I'm sure that some of you will um, uh, have other problems that you found with problem solving, but those are our, um, uh, our current top nine list, if you like. OK, so in terms of the teach poster, um, for a sustainable lean transformation, we are strong believers in the concept of leaders as teachers. That is leaders who take the time to teach and coach their team on the job to develop their capabilities rather than relying on a separate function or external uh, people to do it for them. As you know, the benefits of doing this are huge in terms of advancing your lean journey yourself. Uh, the challenge is, however, how to provide materials that enable leaders to do that. Our current standard, so the best way we know today, is to use a teach poster. And rather than having a 100 page PowerPoint slide deck, we've tried to distill the subject matter down onto one piece of paper, a bit like an A3. It's much less daunting for leaders to use and also much more informal than sitting down in a classroom uh, looking at a screen. All the posters have a similar layout and structure, making them easy to follow and remember. 
as you can see, images and pictures are used over words to stimulate interest and discussion. A facilitation guide is written for each poster, covering the important steps, key points and reasons why for each of the images to assist the leader when starting out to teach. And finally, the poster can be put up in the workspace for future reference rather than being hidden on a PC. OK, so I'll now hand over to Pete. Take myself off mute. OK, yeah, so we're going to go through the top of the uh, teach poster now. It's really important that uh, people understand the basics uh, before you start diving, in, diving into the, uh, the actual process itself. So here we always start with the Lean Transformation Framework and then we cover the purpose, process and people basics of uh, rapid problem solving. So the purpose positions the subjects and why it's important. Uh, the process is the conditions and the considerations required to apply it to your situation. And then the people bit explains the roles and responsibilities really required to make it happen. And that's where a lot of organisations fall down on that. OK, so we're going to start with the Lean Transformation Framework. This, in essence, is our approach and how we do Lean. Uh, and uh, we need to ask, really, where does problem solving fit in uh, to the framework? But first of all, the framework consists of five dimensions which all need to be considered and are balanced uh, for a successful lean transformation. And these dimensions, it's not really a model. It's a series of questions to ask about your situation so you can apply lean to it. And it starts off with number one, which is what is our value driven purpose? So what are we trying to achieve for our customers? And more specifically, what problems are we trying to solve to actually achieve that purpose? So clearly you need to be a competent problem solver if you're going to answer the first question. Uh, so however, though, it's probably likely that you're going to come up against other problems when tackling questions two, uh, two through to five as well. We therefore see problem solving and thinking ways the number one lean skill. And the reason we decided to use it to launch our lean learning journey platform last year uh, that we started as it's so important to start with this. If you think about it, though, a lot of uh, familiar lean tools that we know and love, like 5S, you may have heard of, standardized work, value stream mapping, uh, changeover or SMED, were all created to try and solve some specific problems. So problem solving, though, is really the number one lean skill to master before anything else. A full explanation of the, the lean transformation framework can be found on our website, it's uh, detailed below. Or you can watch our latest YouTube video that we've just done an interview with John Shuck, who created the LTF. Uh, and you can see what he has to say about it and why he created it. OK, so first of all, let's look at purpose and why problem solving is so important. So firstly, we need to accept that problems are good and we should see them as uh, golden nuggets and opportunities rather than something that should be swept underneath the carpet. So Taichi Ono said having no problems is the biggest problem of all. And we should therefore actively seek out problems and start digging them up for people to tackle. Taking a step back, however, and looking at the big, uh, bigger picture, look at the flow chart on the right there. So clearly as an organisation, you want to remain competitive, which means highlighting and solving the problems that we talked about. But in doing that, we have two big benefits. One is to develop the organisation, but more importantly, to develop your people. And that's why it's so important supporting people and business development at the same time so it's not different things so looking at the process next uh, and some considerations around applying it there are four key elements in respect to problem solving that you need to think about the first is to encourage the go see approach uh, so a little bit like there with the uh, crime scene investigation you've all seen csi maybe on tv so you need to go to the actual place where the crime took place and see the evidence while it's still fresh and look for, cl for clues. Yeah. Secondly, it's important to have a scientific method to follow and uh, approach problem solving. We have, uh, in this case, four steps for rapid problem solving. So it's a simplified version of eight step. And we'll talk about that a bit more. Thirdly, to encourage uh, PDCA thinking uh, to close the loop and more importantly, ask what did you learn uh, for the next time? So the point of the clock in the middle is to invoke speed. Uh, the better and quicker we can do the uh, problem solving, the faster we learn and the faster we can improve. And finally, the last element is to never give up to reach your ultimate goal. So each problem solver is a step closer to your destination. And as leaders, we have to recognise the achievement and encourage our people to take the next step. OK, so 
just as part of the process then there's been a lot of confusion around problem solving and this framework we put together to try to pull that together and help people through the sort of quagmire of uh, understanding problem solving so as you I'm sure you, that you understand that it's not one size fits all for respect to the types of problems you get and the approaches to take to problem solving. But uh, in his book, Art Smalley did a great job of describing the four types of problems. You may have read that already or not, but he describes them as uh, type one is called troubleshooting. Type two is gap from standard. And these are both uh, reactive or cause type problems. Uh, type three is a target condition something you're aiming for and type four is open-ended or sort of innovative uh, uh, type uh, problems and these are created or proactive types of uh, problems to solve so in the framework we've tried to show the different uh, methods you can apply to those types of problems uh, for example type one is described as troublesho troubleshooting uh, unexpected events i.e a good example is a flat tire clearly here you just need to react to the problem and fix it now just change the tire. In terms of the problem's property, many of these types of problems happen and they're relatively easy to fix. Analysis time is short. You really don't need to think about it. Just fix the tire and change it. Uh, and these will happen to everybody in the organization. The classic analogy here from Toyota is be to react to the and online and stop the assembly line uh, and react to the problem quickly. Moving up now to the next level method is uh, what we're focused on today, which is rapid problem solving. You can see from the approach, it tends to work well with those type two and type three gap from standard and target condition problems. Typically a four step approach. This tends to be for those data driven type issues used from uh, by frontline leaders and their team members. By nature, they're quite frequent. They're not too complicated or time consuming, but offer a structured approach to get to root cause countermeasures and prepares them well for thinking behind the, the next level, which is practical problem solving. So practical problem solving is what we call A3 or eight step approach. It's also suitable for type two and three problems, but for those uh, more challenging sort of business condition issues as well. And in some cases it's uh, for difficult type four open end problems as well. These problems are tough to solve and therefore they take time and a deeper level of thinking than rapid, but uh, offer greater rewards if you uh, solve them. The trick, however, is not to just fill out and complete A3 templates, but it's more about the logic and thinking way of solving the problem. You'll probably get the thinking now with advanced methods, uh, the last level and uh, the problems in that there's not so many of them around. They're difficult, they take time to solve, they require a lot of analysis and investigation. There are probably only a few people in your organisation that are capable uh, of tackling these issues, which often result in maybe a new product or a new way of doing things, so quite a big step change. The point of the framework is really to get you to think about the types of problems people face and the best method to approach them and then considering the, their level in the organisation. So it's a guide, it's not perfect, but it will help you. So lastly, moving on to people, let's think about some of the roles and responsibilities in an organisation uh, in connection to problem solving. So starting with the simple hierarchy on the left, what we want is everybody in the organisation to be capable problem solvers. An army of them at all levels, right from the team members, right to the senior leaders. And of course, we've just discussed that they're not all solving the same problems, but applying the right approach to those occurring at their level. If we consider the model on the right, let's say that improving processes tackling problems, then this tries to show proportionally how much time we should spend doing those activities based upon our level in the organisation. A team member level, for example, we should spend most of our time doing the value added work or running the process but also have some time made available to improve the process and solve problems. At senior level, we really want uh, those people spending most of the time thinking about strategy and where the organisation should be going next. Also, they have, uh, should be supporting uh, the improvement of the organisation, but a small amount of time of running uh, the, the business and uh, on a day to day basis. The question to ask is where do you see your leaders in the business spending their time? Are they too busy firefighting and running the business day to day with no time for improvement? And why is that? Well, if the whole organisation isn't aligned and mobilised to solve problems at their level, then your leaders are always going to be too busy to improve. 
that's why the uh, leaders as teachers is such a key concept that we support fully to embrace and allow the organization to grow through developing people into being an army of problem solvers. So to do this, you need to have uh, what we call management routines or leadership standard work, some people say. It's a key mechanism to facilitate the time to do this, to be able to recognize, coach and give feedback to people on their problem solving capability. This is the key to coming self-reliant on your lean learning journey. OK, so we've covered very briefly the uh, Teach Poster concept and uh, introduced problem solving, the basics on purpose, process and people. So, Dave, I think it's back over to you to uh, want to see what questions people have. So if you want to type your questions in the chat, please do so. Yeah, or, or you can unmute yourself. Yeah, just unmute. And we can have a chat, which yeah, would be great. Even better. And don't all do it at once. <laughs> Stun silence. 26 people on this Teams thing, and they're all very, very quiet. <laughs> hey guys, how you doing? Uh, it's Morgan. Hi, hi, Trevor here. For, for okay. me, I suppose, yeah, it's really around thinking about how to articulate the question because of so many. Um, for, I, the last slide you had there, you know, I've been doing a bit of reading on that book as well, um, Art's book, because we've deployed an um, eight step methodology and uh, we've invested a lot of time with our people and but we're finding that the problems are just taking too long. So, you know, back to yourselves, could you just give and share some advice as to what uh, gaps we might have in terms of our approach? Who wants to tackle that? Dave, do you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, so I think it comes back to the, the framework, Trevor. So, um, I mean, yeah, we've done a lot of activity with supporting sort of um, partners on on the eight step process and it does take a long time <clears throat> one to understand the eight steps and then secondly to actually tackle a problem um so i think the trade-off is really to think about um where they are in the business in terms of you know their their seniority and what type of problems are you, are you handing off to them um as david said sort of you know a3s are great but um if all you've got is a hammer everything looks like a nail so um, I think one is try and be a bit more selective about the, the types of problems you're handing off to those people. Um, there should be more, you know, bigger bigger problems and probably therefore take a bit more time to analyse and, and get to some, some conclusion. Um, the reason why we've got this kind of four step method is, you know, we're trying to position this in terms of we don't need an A3 for everything, but we do need the thinking way. And also this is really good for those day-to-day -day performance related issues um, yes. to get people to tackle using that method and then for the bigger business challenges say okay yeah we do need to drop onto that to do an a3 but i mean my experience at toyota was you know once if you if you got an a3 to do you're probably talking 12 weeks to to see it through to some kind of conclusion so even even there it, it still took some time that's very helpful thanks for sharing i i can see I can see, you know, so for, for the court we're going at, you know, where they're, you know, the shop floor, where they're mm -hmm. learning the eight step methodology as their first um, tool to solve problems and they're applying it at the, you know, at the day to day. And, and, and hence there's a there's a disconnect because they actually need probably obviously a, to build their own problem solving skills, but B, they need a rapid problem solving methodology. Hence why myself and all my team are here on the call as well, yeah. you know, so that there's, we, we recognize that, but so it's kind of useful to hear that and some of the timelines that you've mentioned. So thanks for that. I mean, the eight step, looking back at Toyota was, you know, you're only kind of introduced to the eight step when you were either, you know, kind of uh, senior, you know, group leader or senior group leader. So you kind of team member, team level, team leader level. Um, we're not kind of um, expected to use it because they, they didn't, you know, they didn't expect to be seeing those kind of challenging problems, but more on the day to day performance related issues. So, so yeah, you're probably overwhelming them a bit and that's probably why it's taking quite a long time. Yeah, and it's, so, it, it can knock their confidence as well because yeah, yeah, yeah and then they don't, yeah, they don't believe yeah. the process, and then you back to square. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, yeah. And, and and actually, what the, the other problem is, if 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 the confidence is knocked and it takes too long, people just go back to what they did before, and what they did before was not probably not use plan, do, check, act. 
So not use the thinking way to mm. think about the concern, think about the cause and think about the ca- countermeasure. In a lot of cases, people are not even really using something as simple as five whys. So, so, so if, if you put all of those things together and then on top of that, you ask them to fill in standardized forms, you know, beautifully and all the rest of it, um, it's a recipe for disaster, isn't it? Mm, absolutely. Yeah. And you're going to give an example, aren't you, Dave, later, you know, about because, you, you know, at that level, uh, Trevor, you need to uh, really integrate it into their work and make it visual in their own work area to capture problems. Yeah, and then manage the actions on those problems as well. It's not just about capturing the problem and and you know getting to root cause, where they've got to manage the action as well. So yeah. you need to integrate that into their work area and, and what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, Dave will give an example of that later, though. Yeah. There's a couple of other questions. Um, uh, John has asked, "What's the biggest challenge you see with leaders learning problem solving, and what level do they need to be at for effective coaching of problem solving on the shop floor?" Um, don't know whether you want to have a go at that, Pete. Yeah, so we always kind of recommend that you, at uh, sort of as Dave was saying, then at sort of manager level, uh, you know, that people start off with eight step because they're going to tackle their larger business problems. Uh, and the reason why we say that is, you know, they need to know that because they they get faced by those problems. But also, then once they know eight step, it's very easy for them to teach the next level down on four step. Uh, because they've got the thinking and they understand it well because they've had to go through the eight step learning process. So we kind of recommend uh, when we go into organisations, we'll start off with eight step with the uh, more senior leaders, the manager level, and then we'll get them to teach it to the next level down and uh, yes. give them skills. Yeah, and that's important. We don't ever go down to that level because the, you're taking away the ownership. Uh, from the leaders, yeah. So they've really got to do that themselves to the next level down and show and lead it and, and develop the systems to support it. Yeah. yeah, but but you but you really, you know, you need to do a few before you can just launch into teaching it. You know, it's it's the same old thing, isn't it? Of, uh, you know, if you can't do it yourself, then don't try and teach it. Um, so I think that's the that's the other thing, John is is to um, is to make sure that you've been through the process a couple of times and you're comfortable with the process, then you can start that that uh, that process of actually uh, teaching it to others. Um, but as Pete says, teaching uh, teaching the more simple uh, way of, uh, of of doing stuff um, initially. Um, Dale's got this question in general, what percentage of problems can or should be solved using RPS versus PPS? I think it's very difficult. Depends on the situation, really, to, you know, to give you give you a number. Um, but what I would say is that, you know, in any in any process, you know, if we if we use Louis uh, on the on the call somewhere, if we use his example of a, a car retail, um, there's there's tens of problems every single day relating to customers and, and all that kind of thing um, and a large proportion of those can be solved with the practical problem solving versus maybe um, some of the managers each having one or two a3s on the go you know what you don't want to do is the the, the lead time is is a function of the work in progress so the lead time to solve problems is a function of how many problems you've got on the go at any one time because you've only got a certain amount of time to solve problems and to do the work so don't and don't end up with you having yourself loads and loads of work in progress of part finished problems that's the, that, that that's what i would say right okay we keep the things coming um in the um in the in the chat um luke's very kindly told us that we need to crack on because of the uh, the, the time of what quite a bit to to go through so in this section what we're going to do is give a high level overview of the thinking way behind each step of rapid problem solving behind the method which is obviously based on plan do check act as indicated in the different colors in the diagram so red for plan blue for do and so on um, you'll also see that the largest portion is step three which is highlighting where we'll spend most time while solving solving the problem okay 
So step one's called concern, and the concern is the problem to solve. But how do we decide whether we have a problem? Problems can be, uh, they can come onto our radar, radar in various ways. Understanding and identifying the eight ways through observation can help you uncover the problems with the work in your organisation. Uh, you may have internal or external customer complaints. Uh, you may be reworking products or process steps, trying to deliver to your internal or external customer. Or you may just have gaps in your KPIs um, and, and that gives you a problem to solve. So having a gap is something measurable um, and, um, and having a gap in something measurable is very important. If we're not able to answer the question, what's the gap? We're probably not clear about what the problem is to solve. The concern is then just an opinion or someone's perception. And if we can't measure it, then we can't improve it. The gap is the difference between where you should or you want to be, let's call it the standard, and where you currently are. And there are two main types of gaps. There are uh, cause gaps and created gaps. Cause gaps are there to get back to the current standard and created gaps are where you improve from the current standard to a new standard. The gap or problem will no doubt be made up of many things. So we need to analyze it into more manageable items and using data or Pareto charts and the 80-20 rule from the seven problem solving tools, those are good ways to determine the problem to pursue and what to focus on. Um, step one clarifies the problem that you're trying to solve in simple numeric terms. Step two is contain, and this is where we ask if, um, if we can stop the problem now. So think of step two like a band-aid, a plaster. Uh, it focuses on stopping the bleeding and protects the customer, which will buy you time to solve the problem properly by following the rest of the rapid problem solving steps. Stopping the problem flowing out immediately to an internal or external customer will, will relie uh, relieve pressure and limit the chance of you jumping to solutions. It gives you time to collect data and to understand the problem better. Standardizing the activity or method using the five W's to H, so why, what, where, when, who, how, and how much questions will ensure that the containment's robust and thoughtfully considered. Also make sure you provide feedback to check that the containment is working and visualize the results. There's a warning. When dealing with problems, a lot of organizations stop after step two, contain. And this usually builds in waste and cost into the process. And even worse, the problem can happen again, as you didn't really understand the causes and end up in a firefighting loop. The purpose of step three cause is to investigate and find the root causes of the problem to pursue. Root causes are fundamental um, for um, the occurrence of the problem. You know, it's a, that's the fundamental reason. By, uh, by implementing countermeasures to the root causes, we prevent the problem reoccurring. Before finding the root causes, however, we need to establish direct causes of the problem to pursue. And this will be proven by data or experiment through go see and study. So just like a light switch, turn the cause off, the effect stops, the light goes out. Every effect has a cause, and this is what you must prove through data or experiment. So you use data to establish the direct causes, or you use the Nishikawa or a fishbone diagram as a framework to structure potential causes through brainstorming. If you don't have any data, you will have to collect and analyze some um, using the seven problem solving tools. Uh, check sheets, Pareto diagrams are great ways to do that uh, to establish the direct cause. The direct causes should be clearly summarized and proven with data as these are what you need to prevent from recurring and are needed for any 5Y analysis. The 5 whys focuses on the root cause of your problem to pursue, probably one of the most difficult steps to do correctly, but it's done by starting with the problem to pursue and then using the direct causes as the first level of your 5 whys analysis. By asking why, you drill down to the root cause. 5 whys isn't always 5 whys, it might be 6, might be 4, might be 8, um, it might be more or less, but each why and each why might give you multiple answers. So you need to capture all of them, use data and facts at each stage to understand the proven pathway to root causes. 
you can then check your thinking logic by going back up the path and asking therefore and also make sure that the statements make make sense from a chronological point of view make sure your root causes don't blame individuals will stop the problem from happening again are a proven source and are something that you can do it's in you yours or your organization's control uh, some good tips are always to go and see the actual person, the product, the process and place with your own eyes to truly understand the situation and find the root causes. Step four is countermeasure and confirm. So, um, so concern, contain, cause, countermeasure and confirm and focuses on what you will do to close the gap. The starting point for developing countermeasures is the root causes from the analysis made in step three. Now you can go and develop specific actions to address the specific root causes rather than the large vague gap that you probably had right at the beginning of the process. This is why people fail to solve a problem. They jump to solutions. You should have more than one countermeasure idea. So think of maybe three alternatives. Uh, the countermeasure ideas should be evaluated based on some kind of criteria, for example, cost, lead time, risk ease of implementation. Uh, the countermeasures should then be prioritised based on the evaluation and by the impact of how much they will help close the gap by. A countermeasure should make a change by doing something different. They should be planned and implemented quickly through Plan Do Check Act to ensure that they are seen through to conclusion and their impact evaluated. Teamwork and the right behaviour is the key to seeing countermeasures through quickly. So we need to confirm the results of the countermeasures by asking why did we close the gap? Ongoing measurement enables you to understand uh, that and understand the impact of the countermeasures that address root causes of the problem to pursue. We should ask, what's the result? Did we close the gap to the standard required? Can we remove the containment activity that was put in place so that we don't build waste into the work uh, with extra steps? Um, the next activity then focuses on standardising the changes made and sharing the learning, or as, as the Japanese say, yokoten. So yokoten, the RPS activity to help develop the organisation. This involves creating or updating work standards to use as a new baseline for the work and to do further improvement. You have to take responsibility. Individuals have to take responsibility for doing this rather than relying on the organisation or others to do it for them, which in turn helps develop people. Um, it's a very brief overview, but our, we've got a skill level two course, uh, which gives you much more detailed understanding of the thinking behind each step and the case study um, uh, exercise to practice using the rapid problem solving quadrant chart, which David Marriott is going to take you through. OK, so we've covered the teach poster concept, the introduction to problem solving in terms of purpose, process, people, and we've also done the method. I'll now I'll hand over to David. Thanks, Dave. OK, so I'm going to cover the, uh, the concept of the RPS quadrant charts and also the, the learning journey that we've developed for, uh, for rapid problem solving. Um, there's a famous quote by Albert Einstein, so if you can't explain it simply enough, then you don't understand it well enough. So this is really the thinking behind the RPS quadrant charts, being able to simply explain your thinking onto one piece of paper. As you can appreciate, that's a real skill and takes some time to do. And in, uh, as Dave mentioned, in our level two understanding course, we show you how to complete an RPS quadrant chart using a case study. So the case study provides a fictional sequence of events for a team leader challenged with the problem of meeting customer demand and increasing output. So each step is broken down as per the process um, Dave's just explained. Part of it's in the form of uh, dialogue with his team, supplemented by data and information gained as he proceeds with his investigation. Um, the content is then translated into each section of the quadrant chart. You get the chance to do it yourself and then compare with how a solution might look. An emphasis is on visualization and being able to summarize the key points to build build the case and solve the problem. So the, the case study is all well and good um, and gives you some understanding of applying the four steps. Um, but the challenge starts really when people start to tackle their own problems. So this is when the rubber hits the road, shall we say, and this can be quite a daunting prospect. 
So sometimes all logic can go out the window and it's a lot easier to fall back and start jumping to solutions rather than following the, the four step process. So to try and combat uh, this, therefore, we've also created a, uh, a guide to describe what a good quadrant chart should look like and the expected content. And that's one of the, uh, the handouts that, that you've been given. So again, each step is broken down and covers what the story should look like. So step three, for example, takes you through finding the direct and eventually the root causes, having determined the, the problem to pursue. Um, this involves further use of the seven problem solving tools, such as check sheets and burritos, and also cause effect diagrams. And from our experience, we found that um, and feedback that this is, you know, proved to be quite a useful sort of aid memoir for people to keep in their in their back pocket. But that's only uh, part of the story. The last piece of the jigsaw puzzle is being able to evaluate whether someone has met the criteria of following the four steps and completing the quadrant chart to a good level and solving the problem. So to address this, we've developed an evaluation method for the uh, for the quadrant charts. So each step again is broken down <clears throat> and what we've done is uh, put it into three criteria. So we have on the uh, on the left expected content. So really we're just pulling the key images from the uh, from the posters there. An evaluation level, which is in the middle. So this is a score out of five and uh, what we're trying to achieve is at least a three. So we see three is a, a good level. And then on the right, the coaching questions. Um, so these are probably the most important part as they offer the leader open style questions to encourage the right thinking for each step and steer the team member in the right di direction to achieve the uh, desired evaluation level. So when you're kind of starting out, the criteria can be used by uh, obviously the person conducting the RPS to check that they've completed each step sufficiently um, and also the, the coach to check and provide guidance through the problem solving activity. OK, so that was quadrant charts. So I'd just like to explain in terms of the uh, our sort of learning journey for RPS that we recently experimented with one of our research partners. So this is a, a Toyota car dealership based in Canada. So um, as you can see, we took them through two phases of development. Um, the first is where they learned the method approximately over three weeks. And the second where they demonstrated their capability by solving an actual problem. So skill levels one knowledge and two understanding were conducted online using our um, sort of web based platform, as Dave mentioned. Um, after those, we did live debriefs to confirm their understanding and also to answer any further questions that they may have. And as uh, as you've seen, the skill level two use the case study to practice each of the steps and complete a quadrant chart. They then select a real problem to tackle um, to use and uh, using the RPS method. And we supplemented that with weekly sort of live coaching sessions uh, to check their progress uh, and also their approach. And this took about four weeks to complete with their first uh, problem. Depends on the amount of uh, data they had and also the, the problem that they, uh, they selected as well. So to assist the delegates, um, basically we gave each one a workbook. So this contains a copy of the teach poster and the case study exercise a blank quadrant chart to complete the exercise as, as shown there, um, what the story would, would look like or should look like as you've got the rating sheet, which you've got, uh, and also at the back, of course, the sort of answer to the case study for reference. And we use this workbook in parallel uh, with the delegates and the uh, online platform as they sort of progress through the uh, each of the four steps. text. Also, for an actual problem, one of the teams saw So as you can see in the top left corner, um, in June they had a gap of 42 vehicles versus their standard of zero. So they didn't want any any rework or rejobs. After analyzing
questions. So it was assumed. Causes. They found that they didn't have any further. Now handled in this way, um, will I do specific training and check and confirm that te technicians can do the work correctly rather than uh, assuming that they can? OK. So now it's your chance uh, to have a go at coaching and evaluating someone's RPS step one, hopefully with a, a fun exercise. So you'll need the documents to hand that were sent out to you um, in the invitation. I'll go through those in a minute. Um, but the idea here is what will happen is we will present to you uh, an RPS step one. And using the documents, we'd like you to think of um, some coaching questions. So you're not trying to solve the problem, but you're trying to coach the individual. Um, and also uh, eventually evaluate what level of achievement do you think they've uh, they've managed in terms of the rating, so from one to five, and then also think about some um, some advice or next steps that you would offer the uh, the individual. So just to recap, um, what the story should look like for step one. So there should be some background, so this should give some context to the problem, set the scene, as we say. Um, pictures or graphics or supporting data can be used to help this also. Um, obviously, the gap should be clearly visualised uh, between the standard, so where you uh, should or want to be, and the current situation in terms of where you are. And also, we want to analyse the gap to determine the problem to pursue, or in other words, kind of the biggest contributor to, to that gap. Uh, Frito diagrams are useful to do this, and also we must ensure that it's, um, it's quantified. So to evaluate the step one, please refer to the criteria sheet that you've been given. Um, so expected content, evaluation levels and coaching questions. So the expected content is a reminder from the teach post of what you're looking for. Uh, evaluation levels run from one to five. Um, the one being the lowest, five being the best. So we're trying to get um, to at least a three, which is a good solid level. Um, obviously, you must fulfill the whole criteria uh, to achieve that level. So um, you must be clear if, if not what the delegate needs to do in order to uh, to move to the next level. OK, and then that leads on to the coaching question. So these are generic, but obviously give you some idea of what to ask in order to try and pull from the uh, from the individual uh, rather than push and tell them what to do. So just remember, you're not trying to solve the, uh, the problem for them. OK, so what will happen next is uh, we'll present the step one uh, for a problem one of our colleagues is trying to solve. After the presentation, uh, we'll kind of go to the AHA slides and then use the documents to try and coach that delegate and evaluate their step one. So please have the documents to hand and um, so you can make some notes if you wish and good luck. OK, so um, good to meet you all. My name's Ivor Rishu. So um, I'm very happy and pleased to be uh, with you today to present my uh, my RPS step one. So the, the RPS title is uh, CADIA Machine C OE Improvement. So moving on to step one and, and 1.1 background. Um, so in Q1, we found that um, the OE percentage was not high enough. And um, we, we found that the CADIA Machine C is always stopping and causing problems. So we decided to improve that. Um, as you see on the right, you just see a, a simple uh, graphic there of the, the, the cell uh, with, the, with the CADIA machines in there and the operator. And obviously we're, we're focusing on the, the, the CADIA C with the low OE percentage, which kind of brings me on to the uh, 1.2 and clarifying the problem. So what I've got there is a, a graph, a um, nice bar chart there of the, the, the OE percentage over the, the weeks. So you can see there that um, we've kind of got a, a, a gap there from, from where we should be at the 85 percent to where we are. And then um, obviously from the training, I understood that we, we need to analyse that um, that gap. So uh, what I did is I've got the top five there. Um, and what you can see is that um, the top top one is actually five hours on the sensor. Um, so, you know, we've kind of decided that the uh, the problem to pursue is the, the sensor on the CADIA machine C. OK, so thank you very much for uh, for listening. I think um, I 
think we're going to hand over to, to Peter now, who's going to uh, obviously field some some questions from yourselves. So please please be gentle and quite nervous. It's my, my first RPS, so don't ask me any difficult questions, please. They won't be brutal, I'm sure. <laughs> OK, so think about how you'd coach either issue yeah, to achieve a level three rating on his RPS quadrant chart. Yeah? OK, so what coaching questions do you have for either issue? So to help uh, you with that question is look at some of the coaching questions on the evaluation form. They might help you think about the right things to say. Remember, coaching questions need uh, to get him to think about the situation and what he needs to do, not tell him what to do. So let's see what questions you uh, come up with. So if you start typing them in, that would be great. Okay, what is OE? OE, it's um, is it a question to either. Yeah, yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Right, okay, so yeah, so OE is, um, it's a bit like OE, overall equipment e effectiveness. We just call it um, sort of um, OE for sure. So uh, so yeah, it's, it's like a rolled up uh, percentage of um, our ability to hit cycle time versus any quality rejects we have and then if there's been any breakdown so that's the the oe percentage that we've got okay thanks for clarifying that have you been to the gemba and spoken to the team yeah yeah we the team's been involved um um you see the operator there so so uh i've been with bob um down there to, to have a look at the machine see with them and and yeah and what what did they tell you um Machine C is not very good. Oh, OK. So can you show me where the sensor is located? Um, yeah, I think you've got um, I think you've got the full full RPS. We're just di discussing um, step one. But yeah, it's on the um, it's on the door. Of the uh, of the machine. Okay. Here's another one for you then, Ivor. What is the top five in the graph? Um, so the, the top five is um, the, the top five kind of um, uh, reasons for, uh, for, for for stopping or not being able to to hit the um, hit the cycle time. Okay. Okay. Well, we're going to move on now to next question then. So, what gaps have you seen between Ivers RPS and what the story should look like? So refer back to the what the story looked like document that you've got and contrast it against Ivers. How could he improve it visually to, start to tell his uh, uh, story better? So just put your answers on what he could do to improve it against the, uh, the standard we've got there. He hasn't yeah. stated the gap. Oh, yeah. Not so clear, is it? Yeah, that's good. Well done. Add the units of measure, are not on there either. Yep. Current state versus future state, not so clear. Scope of the problem is not stated in simple terms. Ah. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, well, I've got another one. Link the gap analysis sensor so to the actual downtime related to oh, the issue. Very good. That's very good. full marks for whoever put that on. Yeah. <coughs> okay. All right, let's move on then. So, what rating would you give Ivers RPS step one? Okay, so would it be level one? Although the problem is stated, it's not clear why it is a problem or why they are tackling it. Or is it level two? The gap clearly is visualised, the problem clarified, but the gap analysis is insufficient to truly determine the problem to pursue. Or is it level three, where the gap is clearly visualised, the problem clarified, and it's uh, the, the thorough logic gap analysis has been shown on the problem to pursue? And uh, or is it level four as uh, <laughs> level three, but it's also impact as well? Nobody's great you do a level four or five either. Uh -huh. Nobody. Yeah. So, so what we got? We got quite ones, threes, one, three, okay. Okay. So mostly level two either. So it's not not bad for a first attempt. Yeah, yeah not bad, I suppose. 
OK, well, well, we'll discuss what that is later, what that means later. OK, so the last question is then, what would you uh, recommend for your next steps be for Ivor? So as a coach, it's important to get Ivor to be clear on his next steps. So what changes would you get him to think about to doing for his next steps on his uh, step one? Put your recommendations in. OK, so. Hmm. <laughs> Articulate the gap. Well done. Yeah, it's good. So it's clearer to find the gap here. Identify the gap. Yeah, better. It's a bit quantify yeah. the gap. Ah, they're all getting it. OK. Ah, so very customer good. impact. Wow, very good. We're short shipping good. at the moment. Yeah, getting to think about that. With that downtime. Yeah. Very good. Any more? Clearly define the problem. Yeah, it's not so clear. Control study to isolate the factors and identify any analysis of replicate failure modes. OK, yeah, we next steps. Tell a story better. Oh, how dare you. <laughs> Been up all night. Well, you're only level two either. Yeah, so <laughs> what would be the effect of doing nothing? Ah, good question. Um, Very good. Just carry on short shipping to the customer. Mm. Yeah. Change the sense of vendor for better quality parts. OK. Mm. OK, good. Well, that's a good good question. So back to uh, Ivor to explain his changes that he's thinking about. <laughs> yeah, so I think um, probably at best, <laughs> we'd probably rate that at level one. Um, so really, although the problem is stated, it's not clear why it's a problem or why they're tackling it. So um, what I've done here is some of the questions that we would probably ask, some of which you asked also some great questions. Obviously, interested time, we won't run them through all of them. But once you start to refer back to the guides and the standards, obviously, there's many questions that you can be raised to help and coach the, and improve the thinking way. So, um, as you can appreciate, developing capability takes, takes time and practice, not just a simple case of attending a course. I um, hope you enjoyed the exercise. So I think, Dave, over to you to, uh, to summarise and wrap up. OK, thanks, Dave. Right, so rapid problem solving is useful for individuals teams and organizations arguably concern contain cause countermeasure check is easier to to learn and to grasp than um eight step problem solving the thinking though can be applied to a large proportion of small problems the fact that it can be applied frequently and with a short cadence means that the skill can be taught regularly, practiced regularly, and therefore mastered. But don't forget, the approach is fractal. It can be used at team level and at an organizational level as well. So don't let the forms get in the way of your learning. As with A3, not all problems need a quadrant chart, but they do need a thinking way. So this, this really, this example, um, highlights that so to practice um, it helps to make the process visible rapid problem solving is effective when it's integrated into performance management and improvement management systems this simple example um, from the partner that we discussed shows how simple this activity is they integrated the rapid problem solving into their daily meeting um, and this is a a great example of a problem that came up. The vehicle in the lot, i.e. the car park, won't start. Contain the problem, just boost the car. You know, put, put, the, uh, put the jump leads on it and, and start it up. The next step of it, though, is that the battery's flat. What's the cause? The battery's flat. And then you need to ask why. Why is the battery flat? Well, the car stood a month since it was pre-delivery inspected. Why is the car stood a month? since it was pre-delivery inspected. Well, we, P we PDI the cars ASAP. Well, why do you do that? Well, we do that to keep technicians busy and because we get paid for the PDI. Hold on a minute. That's overproduction. Let's then start thinking about that and what we could do differently. So in that particular example, they didn't need the quadrant chart. They didn't need to do the to do the to to fill in the forms. What they're doing is 
they're, they're doing that problem solving and that thinking way as part of the management system. So the team have integrated the concern contained calls countermeasure and check into their daily team board. In this example, the vehicle in the lot wouldn't start. And what all of you should really think about is think about your visual boards and whether you've got a cadence for them and whether actually PDCA is embedded into them. That's the key thing. You know, when you walk around places quite a lot of the time, that's not that's not the case. And, and that's a that's an easy next step, really. So to conclude, uh, materials um, of you've seen today and more of them are available on our website via the lean, lean learning platform uh, if you wish you can have individual access to all level one and two online courses uh, and we've recently launched a, an annual subscription for that which works out less than 10 pounds a month it's 119 pound 99 a year um, for um, for enterprise and multiple me membership you can email us at uh, info at leanuk.org as a not-for-profit, the, re the revenue that we make from the platform goes back into the platform. It just enables us to make and develop more learning materials that we can then pass on cost-effectively to you. Um, subscription memberships also gives you access to all the on-demand webinars that we do, so ones like this, and also exclusive membership to the uh, LEA discussion group that will be coming in 2022. You can find out more about the subscription at leanuk.org forward slash subscription. The other thing to add is we like to partner with organisations to further our research and support their lean journey um, through online and face to face activities. If you if you're interested in that, we've several themes that we want to take a look at within uh, through 2022. Um, and, um, you know, we, we're always uh, we're always on the lookout for, uh, for for folk we can do that with. So um, we're just one minute past, but we, as we said, we're staying on for 15 minutes. What questions do you have about the presentation or any of the stuff that we just mentioned? Thoughts, comments, questions? Unmute yourself and off we go. I'm going to have to shoot off and see Ivor. I think he needs some more support, so there might be some time. <laughs> you can just ask away or type in the chat. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm just wondering how long does it take for you to get fully familiar with the rules? Because obviously, like, you're talking. Um, the great tools for us to have, but I'm thinking if I'm down on the line, how long did it take you um, before it became second nature? <laughs> <laughs> or does it never? <laughs> yeah, well, well I, would, I would say it's like learning a language. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you don't keep practicing it, you soon fall out of bad habits. And, and you go back to jump into solutions because I think that's really our natural tendency uh, is to jump to solutions. I often use the example of um, if we were going through the the bush in Africa and we and we saw a big lion, we wouldn't get a flip chart out or a whiteboard and start thinking about concern <laughs> stuff, would we? We, we, you know, we just hope we'd, we'd got one of our children with us so that we could feed that to the lion to run off. Um, so, 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 so I think, you know, I think, um, I think it's, it, it is a practice thing and, and you've got to actually put the effort in to do the practice. But as Dave mentioned in the, um, in the thing that we were talking about, you know, that, that, um, that fuel tank example, um, which we just done with the Toyota dealer in Canada was carried out over two, three weeks, something like that. Yeah. And, and and when you kind of think about the that as a problem, you know, 42 rework jobs, and that was 15 rework jobs out of 42. The the fact that actually they were able to go through that process and then say, well, we've got lots of other jobs that become rework because we don't really follow a good process when we when we get these um, campaigns, you know, it's, it's, it's when they're warranty campaigns, really, and they're doing a lot of them. 
and and so just just that one solving that one problem actually was much bigger than than mm -hmm. just the <clears throat> Um, it's the trigger point as well, isn't it, Dave? You know, you showed the performance board there that you put in place. So yeah. when you've got, if you've got clearly visual KPIs and you've got a gap, then the expectation there's a problem solving activity to close the gap. And it connects the two then, whereas a lot of people have boards and performance KPIs and they're not connecting the problem solving into it yeah, to close the gaps. Yeah. So that kind of makes it a habit then because we've got a gap on the KPI. What are we doing about it? And then how are we managing that action to closure uh, yeah. in your performance review? Yeah. Uh, okay. And a lot of people start trying to solve the problem in their performance review, which is wrong as well. You should be doing that during the day, you know, with the problem. And the review that you have in your performance is all about making sure the action was closed and did it have a good effect? You know, so people mix all of those things up and, you know, that don't really learn it well. But if you've got the yeah. rigor of a good performance system, uh, then that helps as well, you know. Yeah, the, guy that did the, the guy that did the RPS was the like the technician team leader. <clears throat> so the, the reason why I went through the quadrant chart was really to embed the the learning. Okay. So the, he kind of you know became second nature to go through that process. So as a, as we said, he's not conducting quadrant charts and filling them out for every problem, but initially to get him into the thinking way was uh, was necessary. He's now translated that to the board as Dave Dave shown has shown. Um, there's some some problems which would be useful to share with others. It's worth documenting and going through the the RPS process. But um, for that four you know four step approach on the daily issues, we, we can just skip through that and you know have a much better outcome than what they would have done normally. But to, but to answer your question a bit more directly, Victoria, three to four weeks. You know, depending on whether actually you end up with something that's successful first time because that's also you know it's really important to choose the right thing when you start as well and there's a skill to that you know, don't choose something that is a massive um, for you know for uh, as a first as a first go because probably if it's massive and it's been happening for a very very long time it might be very very difficult to solve so so you choose something that you know that you've got a good idea that it will be solvable using it because that then gives everybody confidence really thank you that's okay. a good tip <laughs> yeah um okay trevor if we were to deploy this approach what would be next steps into an organization pete go on you 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 have a go at that one uh yeah so well we, we went through that process yeah so if you were to select the people your team leaders or your managers above and we'd recommend that you go through the, the steps so they could do the online training for the basic knowledge on level one don't waste your time training everybody on that they can just go online and do that and then select someone that's coaching your organization to take them through and check the thinking on level two going through the case study uh, and giving that a go in a kind of safe way through the case study which gets them to practice it and then using the manager as the coach then or the leader above them that's been through this then to coach them through level three and solving a problem so basically following those steps that we recommended that's how we go about it uh, and tune that up i'd recommend that you don't do that to everybody and pilot it in one area with one team first and run through that yeah and uh, a sort of inch wide mile deep thinking when you are deploying it into an organization yeah uh, and then the check act on you know what are the issues you've had with your people it kind of leads into the next question doesn't it I think, Dave? yeah yeah I, I i think you know again just to add to for, for trevor's answer what you what you ideally want to do is is this teaching people to fish so you, you really want a small group that you that you choose as pete says as a pilot and you want to teach them so that they can teach other people because it because internally inside your organization it's what you do yourself that ultimately sticks so so rather than blanket training for everybody you need to make sure that you've got enough support for those initial groups to be successful because if if not 
you, you you actually then can't support enough of those people and then people say well I've tried this before and this this, this doesn't work or, or whatever so so you so you want you want to be building that be mindful of building the capability um, and we're doing that with a partner aren't we at the moment yeah where we've gone in to help them we're working directly with the manager and the process leaders yeah and we're developing them first in rapid problem solving they're going through the first three step stages there that we showed you and then their expectation is to take their team members through that same process uh, uh, exactly yeah, so they can develop them and we help them through that. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that kind of links to Anders yeah. question really about selling the approach. I, I don't really like that term particularly. <laughs> Um, no, that's I why I put it in uh, in apostrophes. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I think people quite often use you know this idea of buying people buying into something. Um, I, I much prefer to think about how you're going to engage people in yes. in a better way of thinking about things, and the best way to do that is actually to have them think about it. So. Rather than push stuff onto them, you actually need to find a way so that actually you encourage them to pull. And, so, and yeah, yeah, just yeah. like lean. It's just yeah, just yeah. Like, just, just like lean. Good, good example that again. We've just done that with a partner company. We were talking about the RPS with them. Then the first thing we did, with the or the leaders did with the team members, is teach them what we call lean fundamentals. So with the team members first, and you may have done this already, Anders, but uh, it takes them through the basics about what is waste and they do that through learning by doing observation and what's non-value added work, what's value added work, what's lead time. Just the very, very basics. It's very quick. But by doing that, they'll observe a process and they'll come up with lots of problems with the work. Yep. Yeah. Uh, when we did just did that in a, in a vaccine company, they came up with, I think it was like 20, 30 problems, Dave, wasn't it, in the first? Yeah. You know, in just within 10 minutes of organization, then they've got the need then to solve all these problems. You know, I was say, I mean, even recognize that some of those things were problems. So you have to go through this alignment with team members first and get them to recognize that those things are problems, you know, waiting and all those things are issues. I mean, a lot of people and again, get and again, used to that. And I, I, I sort of use, uh, you know, what, you know, what, what pisses you off? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You? yeah, solve the problem. And, and, for them. Yeah, and right. you get a flood, and if once you start solving a, a few problems, then all of a sudden, those things that people get used exactly. to just getting on with, they don't do that anymore. Exactly. You know, they yeah, actually start highlight coming. it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where the KPIs come in on performance as well, because some of them just bury them, you know. But uh, you, you got to the really thing about your performance KPIs: are they meaningful for the team members <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, not just the results of the process. Yeah. Yeah. So it depends what they're tracking as well. And then you're kind of forcing them to, you know, come up with problems. You know. yeah. I mean, if you think about the example with the RB3 fuel pump, I mean, that was causing the guy real pain because <laughs> he was responsible for that area. And he's getting all this rework. And then, you know, once we've gone through the process with him to, to solve the problem, he was on board. It, it was sold. You know, that was it. You know, it was, what's the next one? So... Uh, and the reason for doing lean fundamentals with team members also, I think the number one first thing we say to them is about is make the work easier. Yeah. You know, people can relate to that. Uh, yep. And as yeah, making the work easier because everyone wants to come in and do the bit and go home and, you know, not have the boss on the back and, you know, all the all the usual stuff. So yeah, if you can relate it to make the work easier, a lot of people. Oh, hook definitely into the that. most success using that approach because it because it you know who, who doesn't want that. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Nobody <laughs> wants hard to work. You can't to. argue with that. Yeah, so you know, but that you've got to get them to see the waste though. A lot of people just don't see it at first. Yeah, so yeah. you have to go through that observation and you know get them to deep deeply think about the process. Yeah, especially in office areas, people tend to put up with even more you know, than manufacturing. You know, it's just always been that way. Yeah. 